Word Studies with Dr. Ray Winston, a powerful and in-depth study of the Word of God. Dr. Ray? Psalm 119, 105 says, The Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Well, welcome to Word Studies. I am Dr. Ray, and I want to thank God for the opportunity to study with you the ever-living Word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Welcome again to Word Studies. On this program, we study in depth the words of God. Recently, we have been studying on the pneumaticon. Pneumaticon, of course, is a Greek word for spiritual things, spiritual matters. Things of the Spirit in particular. However, we're going to be looking at something that is perhaps off the beaten path. What I mean by that is it's something that we don't look at that often. Yeah, we're going to be looking at the first king of of Israel, if if you will. Many of you know who the first king of Israel, Israel, Yisrael in the Hebrew, you know who that first king was. Yes, many of you do. But we're going to talk about him and what the uh, ultimate, uh, uh, how can I say it, end of that first king was. Now, remember, uh, you know, the Bible says that obedience is better than sacrifice. And uh, the first king of Israel actually was disobedient. We know what disobedience brings. You know, we wouldn't be in this circumstance that we're in today. I wouldn't even be preaching the gospel, as it were, today, except for disobedience, yes, by <clears throat> one of God's chosen vessels, if you will. Disobeying, disobedient will get you into all kinds of problems. And it hasn't changed today. Many people think that, well, okay, Christ died, he, you know, he, he uh, atoned, as it were, or, 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 or took all of our sins upon him, so therefore, we don't have to worry about sinning anymore. Well, that's not true, yeah? <clears throat> there are still penalties for sin or disobedience to God. Now, uh, the first king's name of Israel, his name was Saul, S-A-U-L, Saul. Now, we're not talking about the apostle Paul, whose name was also Saul, before he was changed or before he was born again. His name was Saul. And remember, when God changes you, the Bible says you become a new creation in Christ Jesus. And that's what happened to the apostle Paul. His name was Saul, and God says, well, that name Saul is not good enough. So therefore, he changed his name to Paul. And he became the Apostle Paul. He he was the writer of like two-thirds of the New Testament, if you will. Now, Saul was the first king of Israel. Initially, Saul did very well. I mean, he did everything that uh, he was supposed to do. And then he got to the point where he disobeyed God. The, The first disobedience was that he was supposed to listen to the prophet Samuel. <clears throat> there was something that God asked uh, Saul to do. He was supposed to wait upon Samuel, and Samuel was supposed to offer up sacrifices. Well, <clears throat> Saul got to the point where he was afraid because the Philistines was upon the, the, the nation of Israel. And therefore, Saul was afraid, and therefore he disobeyed God. He did what was the job of the prophet Samuel. He offered up sacrifices. God did not accept that. That was disobedience to God. And uh, then God, of course, decided to remove Saul as king over Israel. Okay? Now, this is not the only thing that Saul did. He did a lot of things that were disobedient to God. Okay? Now, but the worst thing that he did after he had been put down, if you you will, as king of Israel— He disobeyed God, and then he prayed to God after having disobeyed God and God having removed him as king over Israel and made his neighbor, who was his neighbor? His neighbor, David, the king. Now, David looked up to Saul. The anointed one is what Saul was, and David looked up to him. And and many times uh, after uh, Saul found out that David had been given his job as king over Israel, he tried to kill uh, David because he was still, as it were, sitting in the position. It's like now, you know, our presidential uh, election. Uh, You can be elected and you can be the president-elect and not actually in the office. While David was king-elect, 
and not really in the office. And, and of course, Saul was still there until David was sworn in, so to speak. Yeah, And that hadn't happened. So Saul had made up his mind, okay, then uh, if David's going to take over for me, if I kill him, then he can't take over for me and I can still be king. Yeah, So he tried to kill David. That's why the last time we were talking, we were way back in, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 26 and chapter 29 and so forth like that. Yeah, <clears throat> reading about what Saul was doing and trying to kill David so that there would be no, no king to take over for him. Well, there were kings down through the ages who had done the same thing. Herod did the same thing. He had even killed some of his family members, did Herod, yeah, so that they could not ascend to the throne or they would not be a threat uh, you know, to kill him. So he killed them before they could kill him. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we're going to find out, though, that Saul did something even worse. Saul consulted with a medium or a soothsayer yeah, or a psychic, they would call him today. He wanted to know what the future would be in his battle against the, the Philistines because the Philistines had come against Israel again. And usually when that happened, Saul would go to the prophet Samuel, and Samuel would let him know whether or not he would be successful against the Philistines. It seemed like Israel was always in wars against the Philistines, for whatever reason, even from the time that uh, David killed Goliath. Remember Goliath? Yeah, the big tall giant, eight feet tall giant, and he was killed with uh, a stone yeah, from a slingshot that David had. Remember that? And then, of course, then David cut his head off and carried his head around, showing that he was the victory, victor, as it were, over the giant Goliath. Now, Saul evidently was afraid of that uh, Goliath because he wouldn't go up against him. But here comes David, 16 years old or something or other like that, in that general area. He was a teenager, and he killed the giant. Yeah, not with a big sword or anything. He had killed him with the rock, with the rock from his uh, slingshot. He just swung it around and, and uh, hit him right there. Somebody said, well, how could David possibly do that, Dr. Ray? Because the, that big giant had the armor barriers. They had these big metal armors in front of him and all of that stuff like that. Well, <clears throat> he had to have a place where he could see. Yeah, and that's why David hit him right between the eyes where he could see. Uh, and that killed him. Okay. <clears throat> and then he cut his head off. Okay, now, we're going to find out, though, that Saul had gone to a medium and had brought back, brought up from the dead, a Samuel, because Samuel had died, okay? Now, when people die, they don't want to come back to this earth realm, as it were. And when that happened, Samuel asked uh, uh, Saul, why have you brought me up? You know, leave me alone, in other words, you know. I'm in paradise, and I don't want no part of that stuff you guys are have going on. But when uh, Samuel was brought up, he did tell Saul what was going to happen to Saul and his and his armies and his uh, sons. He told them, he said, you, you're going to be defeated. The Philistines are going to defeat you and you're going to die and your sons. And tomorrow, he said to him, you're going to be with me. Now, <clears throat> there are those who believe that uh, Saul, because of his disobedience to God, uh, that he was lost. Well, uh, you know, even that he was trying to kill, kill David, that would mean that he was lost. Well, that ain't necessarily so, yeah? And we're going to find out. Uh, we, we know that, as a matter of fact, because uh, Samuel was in paradise, and Samuel told Saul, tomorrow you're going to be with me. That meant he was going to be with him in paradise, right? Not in hell. Okay, <clears throat> now we want to find out, though, what happened to Saul as a result of what he did. Notice, in uh, the book of, <laughs> I'm getting rid of my Bible, in the book of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 31, we're going to look at what happened, the result of disobedience. Now, he was simply disobedient because some people say, okay, David was disobedient. Well, David did not violate a direct command. It's like when you're in the military, you can violate the rule, if you will, <clears throat> as long as it's not a direct command. Like you're standing in front of the captain, and the captain says, go, <laughs> Dr. Ray, you go and take that hill, okay? And you say, I ain't going up there. I'm not going up there. You know, I might be killed. You know, I'm going the other way. I, you know, I need some water or something. I need some rest. So you go in the other direction. Well, the captain could take his gun out and shoot you if he wanted to. 
Yeah. Because <clears throat> you disobeyed a direct command. Well, that's uh, what uh, Saul did as opposed to what David did, of course, was a sin, committed a sin, if you will. Now, I'm not belittling what David did because many of you know what David did. Yeah. He killed uh, the wife. He, the wife. He killed the husband of a woman that he wanted. He wanted that woman no matter what. He, he said, "Whatever I gotta do, I gotta have uh, Bathsheba. You know, whatever it takes." And uh, so he killed her husband. All right? That's murdered. He murdered her husband. It is a better way of putting that, right? <clears throat> but now, now that was a sin, right? And uh, but it was not a disobedience of a direct order, if you will. Now. Let's find out what happened to Saul. What was the end result of Saul's, not just obedience, but he never really completely repented. He did make the statement of that uh, he had sinned against God, but never actually totally, contritely, if you will, repented of it, which David did. Notice 1 Samuel chapter 31, verse 1. Okay, now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines. They didn't have David there, notice, and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. Then the Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons. In other words, they were, they were on their trail day and night. And the Philistines killed Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malkishua. Those were, those were Saul's three sons. They were all killed. Notice what happens next. In verse 3, the battle became fierce against Saul. The archers hit him, and he was severely wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer. Remember, uh, Goliath had an armor bearer. For well, many of, of, of the, uh, the warriors in those days had armor bearers. And somebody said, what's an armor bearer, doctor, right? Well, that was somebody that carried a big metal shield that they held up in front of the, uh, the, in front of the soldier to protect him from arrows and so forth like that and spears and so forth that the enemy were, were casting about. Yeah. Okay, somebody said, well, why didn't they uh, hit David with one of those arrows or something like that before he could kill the giant? Well, they didn't think they had to because this was a battle between David and Goliath. You know, the one-on-one? Yeah, okay. Now, notice in verse uh, 4, Then Saul, Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. Well, what he was talking about then is that they would, uh, they would, if they killed you, it wasn't that you were just dead, you know. They would, they would abuse your body, if you will, cut off parts and stuff like that, yeah, you know? and make a show of it, if you will. So uh, Saul is saying, thrust me to, through, kill me before they get through, to, to me, because they would have put uh, Saul through a lot of misery before they would actually have killed him. Notice. But his armor bearer would not. In other words, he was disobeying Saul. Why? For he was greatly afraid. You know, the Bible says, fear not. God was always telling you, Jesus said this, was always telling his disciples, fear not. Yeah, but we choose to fear, don't we? Yeah, we don't have to fear. Now, somebody said, well, Dr. Ray, aren't you afraid of some things? Of course I am. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but the Bible says, fear not. So you are, in essence, disobeying God when you walk around or live your life, as it were, in fear. God doesn't want you to be in fear. Notice. <clears throat> For he was greatly afraid. Therefore, Saul took a sword and fell on it. In other words, he committed suicide, right? It's like the Japanese fall on swords or something like that. You know, well, the old-time Japanese, not the new uh, up-to-date Japanese. <clears throat> they, they called it Harry Carey, I believe, where they committed suicide by falling on a sword or something like that. Saul committed suicide. Notice. For he was very, Therefore, Saul took a sword, fell on it, and when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword. Now, you know, many times people say, well, follow the leader. Yeah, I know when you're in the military, you know, whatever the squad leader or whatever it tells you to do, you got to follow the leader. 
Well, now, you know, you have to use wisdom, too. Yeah. Yeah, God has given us wisdom, hasn't he? Yeah, you don't follow your leader to hell, do you? Or, or, or even to die. But this armor bearer was so afraid. Even Saul is dead. So what could Saul do to him if he's dead? Yet he was still afraid. So he fell on his own sword and took his own life. Yeah, It's almost like the people that went down to uh, 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 that place where <clears throat> this preacher led a whole people down into this country. I forget where that country is, uh, uh, is, the name of it. But anyway, he led them down there, and then he poisoned the whole group of people, right? They were following their leader, as it were, right? Even though the leader was going in the wrong direction. Well, uh, Saul, having committed suicide, doesn't mean that I'm, you know, if I'm his armor bearer, I say, well, okay, now, wait a minute, I'm not going to kill you. If you kill yourself, you know, I don't have anything to do with that. I'm out of here, so to speak. But the armor bearer didn't want to live any longer if Saul was dead. So it shows you what uh, a level of respect and fear the armor bearer had for his leader, Saul. Notice. Okay. <clears throat> and he died with him. Notice verse 6. So Saul, his three sons, his armor bearer, and all his men died together that same day. Now, we're talking about the same day, uh, the day after Saul had gone in to the medium, if you will. That same day. Notice. And when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those who were on the other side of the Jordan, saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his son were dead. They forsook the cities and fled, and the Philistines came and dwelt in their cities. It's like uh, if an enemy came over here, say they're Chinese or the Russians or the whoever, yeah, came to this country, you know, and they killed our leader in Washington, D.C. Right? Blew up the White House and the Capitol and all the other buildings right there, okay? <clears throat> the people would be afraid, wouldn't, they? wouldn't we? Yeah, so to speak, yeah. So therefore, we would say, okay, I'm, I'm out of here. In particular, all those people that lived in the Washington, D.C. area. I, I would suppose that all of the, the, the whole Congress, yeah, the House of Representatives and the Senate and the Supreme Court and all of the other whatever who lives in there in Washington, D.C. would say, hey, <clears throat> they've killed our leaders, so we're out of there. This is what happened. So it happened the next day when the Philistines came to strip the, the slain that they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. And they cut off his head. Notice, this is the same thing that David, David did to, the, uh, to uh, the, 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 the giant, Goliath. He cut off his head. Okay? So they cut off Saul's head. What are they going to do with his head, man? He's dead, yeah? Okay, notice. <clears throat> and they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent word throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim it in the temple of their what? of their idols. They wanted to let their gods know that they had been victorious over the king of Israel. Okay? Why was that so important? Because the king of Israel, Saul, had won many battles over the Philistines when he was in the good graces of Almighty God. Now he wasn't, and they lost a battle, and he lost his life, and all of his sons, his three sons, lost their lives. Okay, notice what they did. Then, in verse 10, they put his armor in the temple of the Ashtoreths. Where are the Ashtoreths? Those are those, those idols, those false gods, if you will. And they fastened his body to the wall of Beth Shon. In other words, they were putting Saul on display. Remember in the old uh, Westerns when they had some outlaw that uh, was so difficult to find and they finally caught up with him? I think it might have happened to Billy the Kid uh, or one of those outlaws and that was so notorious. When they did catch them, they would take pictures of them. They would put them in coffins and hang them up on the wall, and then they would take pictures of the whole group to let you know that they were dead, that we had killed all of them. And they would show the dead bodies on the wall. And that's what they were doing with the first king of Israel, Saul. Note, when you get out from under the umbrella of God's protection— Bad things are going to happen to you, aren't they? Yeah, bad things are going to happen, and you don't know when, what, why, how. But bad things are going to happen. That's what happened to Saul, remember, in this earth realm. Now, when Saul actually died, my belief is that he went into the bosom of Abraham, if you will. 
Yeah. Okay. Or the bosom, bosom, or you can say the bosom of Samuel, if you want to put it that way, because Samuel was in paradise, if you will. And Samuel had told Saul, today, you're going to be with me, you and your son, you and your sons. Now, verse 11. Now, when the inhabitants of Jabesh, Gilead, heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men, Gilead was in Israel, all the valiant men arose and traveled all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Beth Shon, and they came to Jabesh and burned them there. Now, notice there are a lot of people, believers in particular, some denomination churches and so forth, <clears throat> don't believe in cremation. Yeah, they say, well, if you're cremated, then uh, your soul is lost. <clears throat> That's not true. <laughs> yeah, no matter what they tell you, it's not true. Because notice here, then they took the bone, their bone, no, before that, they took Saul and his sons down from the wall, and they came to Jabesh and burned them. In other words, they cremated the, the, the Saul and his three sons. Okay? Now, they, they belong, their souls belong to the Lord, right? Now, you know, what happens to your body after you die, after you leave this earth realm or you leave that body? Well, the body that you live in right now is not really you, yeah? The real you is your spirit and your soul, yeah? And they go back to the Lord, yeah? That's what happened even with Jesus when he died on the cross, right? Now, somebody said, well, okay, doctor, you tell that about it. Yeah, okay. But, okay. <clears throat> somebody said, well, you got to explain to me then, okay, if we go back and, and, and our souls go back and our spirits, but our bodies go on the ground, what about Jesus' body? Yeah. Would that be a good question? Yeah, I'm going to give you the answer to it, but let me finish this first. Notice. It burned them there. Then they took their bones Evidently, bones didn't burn, or they, they burned the flesh, okay? Then they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. Now, now, in case you're wondering, well, uh, what happened to uh, uh, Jesus' body and why, okay, I'll tell you what happened to it. He was buried, yeah? Just like uh, anybody today who passes from the earth realm, that is, <clears throat> out of this body, then that body is buried, yes? Jesus' body, of course, was buried. We know that. It was buried in a tomb, right? But <clears throat> the good thing is that he didn't stay buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead, Yes. I mean, I'm not supposed to say, I know that, Dr. Ray. What are you saying to me? Yeah? <clears throat> he rose again from the dead. He, he, he was buried, yes, just like you and I, rose again on the third day. And guess what? He is alive today. Now, he was buried and rose from the dead some 2,000 years ago, okay? And you would think, okay, if he'd been, been dead 2,000 years ago, most people, most ordinary, if you will, people, who are, uh, leave the body, or leave the earth realm, yeah, and leave their bodies, and they bury their bodies, yeah. There isn't anything left. There, you know, the Bible says, ashes unto ashes, and dust unto dust, yes. So there's nothing else left, as it were, but except for Jesus, yeah. And uh, why then somebody would say then that Jesus is body? <clears throat> because Jesus was without sin, yes. His, his whole makeup, body, no, spirit, soul, and body were without sin. Nobody else can say that, yeah? Can you say that? I can't say that, yeah. I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God through faith in his son, Yeshua, Jesus. Now, can you do this, what I just got through saying? Be saved by the grace of God through faith in his son, Yeshua, Jesus. Yes. You can do it. Yeah. Just you. No matter how much sin you've committed. Yeah, you could have you could have committed as much sins as Hitler did, if you will. Yeah. Somebody asked me once, well, Dr. Ray, could Hitler have repented? Absolutely. Yeah. He could have repented, yes. And you could see him again when you get to heaven. Yes. He could have repented. <clears throat> he didn't no. He didn't repent, so therefore he's not gonna be in heaven. He's going to be in hell. Somebody said, is there really a hell, Dr. A? I mean, this sounds almost like what uh, 
what <clears throat> the serpent was saying to Eve. Remember, the serpent said to Eve, will you surely die? And there are people who are saying to me today, is there really a hell? Yeah, okay. Now, <clears throat> how can you find out if there is really a hell? There are two ways to find out if there really a hell, right? You can accept what the Word of God says because the Word of God says there is, yeah? Or, what's the other way, Dr. Ray? You can go there. Now, you know, if you go there, when you're there, you can't get out, yeah? It's not like you go and say, oh, yeah, I see, there's a hell. Yeah, it's hot down here, and I want out, yeah? Remember Lazarus? And, and the rich man, yeah, Lazarus, Lazarus died, and he was in the bosom of Abraham, right? The angel led him into the bosom of Abraham. What happened to the rich man? The rich man died, and the Bible says he lifted up his eyes in hell. Okay, now, I need to say something about that, though, before I'm out of time, is that the rich man died and lifted up his eyes in hell. Some get the idea that if you're literally rich, you know, like some people in the earth realm today are rich, like our president, our today president, he's rich, yeah, materially rich, if you will. <clears throat> Does that by itself mean that he is going to end up in hell? Absolutely not. No. <clears throat> Why did this rich man then end up in hell, Dr. Ray? Wasn't it making the analogy <clears throat> that the rich man men end up in hell? No. If the analogy was that the rich man had not received Christ as his Savior. In other words, he lived for himself. Yeah, He, as Frank Sinatra would say, he did it my way. In other words, he did it his way. And there are a lot of people who say, okay, I want to do things my way. Yeah, well, guess what? Your way will lead you to hell. But there's a way out. Jesus himself said it. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father God, but by me. So if you're thinking, well, they're okay, I'll, I'll, I'll sneak up the back stairway, yeah, or I'll, I'll, I'll move to Mars, you know, when they, when they, when they build uh, uh, <clears throat> houses on Mars. I'll move to Jupiter, and things won't apply on Jupiter <clears throat> that applied here in the Earth realm. Well, as, as <clears throat> I got news for you. <laughs> yeah, you can't hide from God. Yeah. No matter the the furthest star. What is the furthest star? Uh, Mars is ninety three million miles away from Earth. Yes. <laughs> okay. God's there. What is the farthest star from Earth? Like some twenty three billion light years from Earth. Yeah. You so if that won't won't that get me away from God, Doctor Ray, and His rules? Doesn't His rules only apply to those? on earth and not to me because I'm 93 million light years away. Yeah, I knew it for you. He's there, okay? You can't get away from God or his word. The only thing that will last forever is the word of God, yeah? Heaven and earth will pass away. When he says heaven and earth, that's talking about the stars, yeah? Heaven and earth. In other words, all of the stars are going to melt away one day. So if you are one of those stars, if you're 93 billion miles away, guess what? <laughs> yeah, that star is going to disappear. And you still have only one thing left. That's the Word of God. Now, if you're wondering, well, who is this preacher? My name is Dr. Ray, in case you're saying, well, I've heard preachers, but I don't like that preacher. Well, that's okay. You don't have to like me. You have to love me, though. Yeah. If you're a believer, you have to love me. You don't have to like me. Yeah. But my job is to preach the Word of God. Yeah, that's what my job is. I don't have a choice, as it were. I have to preach the Word of God. I have to tell it. Go tell it on the mountain, as the song says. I have to do that. That's my job. I've been chosen to do that. Did I choose to do it myself? No. <laughs> yeah. If I had my choice, I would be sitting on an island in Hawaii drinking a Mai Tai. Okay. You know what? 
I am out of time. If this program has been a blessing to you and your family or has helped you in any way, please feel free to write to us and pray for us. Remember also, we need and appreciate your financial support. Please send your financial gifts and love offerings to Dr. Ray Winston at P.O. Box 1173, Culver City, California, 90232. That's Dr. Ray Winston, P.O. Box 1173, Culver City, California, 90232. You also may call Dr. Ray at area code 310-559-8320 or 800-747-8320. Remember also, God loves a cheerful giver.